afternoon or good night, wherever you are. Um, welcome to this, to this webinar, uh, Automated Content Moderation, Copyright and Controversial Content. Um, my name is Christian Katzenbach. I'm a professor of media and communication at the University of Bremen. Um, and I'm also the German law for cultural, diverse, accessible, and creative Europe funded by the European Union's Horizon 2020 program um, that is hosting this, this webinar today. Um, the webinar today builds up on a workshop three weeks ago, the regulatory landscape for copyright content moderation, evaluation and future trajectory, directories that the colleagues from the University of Amsterdam and University of Siget um, have hosted. The focus, focus back then was on the legal and regulatory landscape, whereas today we kind of zoom in a bit more on the practices and technologies of automated content moderation in the context of copyright. But we also want to look slightly further down the line and more broadly look at automated content moderation um, and their implications also in other areas in order to learn from these areas um, and to bring researchers in the context of hate speech, misinformation, maybe also comedy, um, in a conversation with these debates about copyright content moderation. So that's, that's the aim of, um, of the webinar today. Um, and I have a wonderful uh, lineup of colleagues um, with me today. So this is the lineup to of today. We will have two um, panels. The first one will focus on automated content moderation and kind of the practices and technologies. Um, Joao Carlos Melgues, um, an assistant professor at the University of Groningen and my dear colleague in that project um, since the beginning, will present our own study on automated copyright content moderation. Um, and then Paloma, Paloma Vieja Otero, a postdoctoral researcher from the Dublin City University, um, will we'll make a response comment um, broadening the debate kind of beyond, beyond copyright. In the second panel, um, we will talk about the implications of automated content moderation for diversity and access. So what's, what, what are the ramifications of using increasingly automated content moderation in different areas? And then we will hear a talk by Ariadna Matamaros Fernandez, uh, <clears throat> a professor at the, at the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, and then Julia Reda, um, a um, project manager at the Society for Civil Rights, rights uh, in Berlin, um, and uh, probably one of the most prominent figures in the debates about copyright and digitalization in Europe in general, uh, will we'll do a comment uh, on, these, on these aspects. So that's the fascinating agenda ahead of us. Um, and I think without further ado, I hand over to Joao for our first um, talk. So the floor is yours, Joao. Thank you, Christian. Uh, so share my screen very quickly here. I, oh, I forgot to, let me some... just say maybe two, two um, kind of housekeeping rules. So the first one is that you are open to um, as, as Tastiana already said in the chat, to open, uh, to, if, you have, if you have questions, you can um, post them in the chat and I will channel that, these questions to the speakers directly after the, the presentations and in the, in the Q&A section. Um, so you can do that immediately while, while the people are talking and we will take care of that after that. And the second one is that we are recording this uh, session, this webinar. And we will also post it on, uh, on our website and on our YouTube channel afterwards. So you can um, catch up on that if, you, if, you, if you're missing something or if you need to step out earlier. But also just please note that this is being recorded and put online after the fact. All right. All right. So Joao, here you go. OK, thank you, Christian. Um, so yeah, so uh, we are going to essentially present uh, the results of this almost uh, 18 months working at the Humboldt Institute in this project. Uh, and it's, of course, it is about automated copyright content moderation, but the first part of the presentation I will see is just about generally the policies that's to some extent underpin such a, a automated content moderation. So we're going to begin with the context of this research and the research questions that we were thinking about and trying to answer. Then we're going to um, explain the approach and our methods the findings, uh, first regarding policies, the, then regarding the automated content moderation, and then conclusion. 
So yeah, as I just said, this was a project that was developed between 2020, 2021 at the Humboldt Institute for Internet and Society in Berlin, where I was a postdoc um, working with Christian and other colleagues. This, as um, it has been said already, is part of the Recreating Europe Consortium, which is funded by the Horizon 2020 EU funding scheme with that uh, grant agreement number. Uh, and so what we were trying to understand here was essentially how do social media platforms, and our focus was on social media, not only um, other forms of platforms, regulate um, copyright, right? Um, so, of course, we, I'm, I'm not going into the details of how those research questions emerged, but we, essentially, at the end of the day, we were looking at three main research questions here, right? The first one was how are copyright content moderations organized by platforms into policies? which was a question that we didn't have before we began this um, project. And then we realized that this was actually very important. Uh, the second question was, um, which copyrights content moderation rules do different platforms employ to regulate copyright and how have they changed it over time? So the question is that uh, first, uh, we're not looking at policies themselves, policies as the documents, but actually at the rules that compose those policies. And also we uh, work with the assumption that different platforms would do that in a different way. And also the, this sort of a regulation would change over time. And the last one is more explicitly about um, uh, automated copyright content moderation. And we were essentially trying to understand how those systems work because uh, for reasons that I'm going to explain a bit, we didn't have a lot of data on this, at least in this first part of the project. Um, so, the first very important moment was just to decide which platform you're going to look at. And we were very ambitious, I guess. And we wanted to look at 15 platforms. So we, did, we divided those platforms between uh, mainstream platforms, as you can imagine, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, SoundCloud. Uh, and SoundCloud here was important because it was a, a platform that represented to some extent European platforms. Second, alternative platforms such as Diaspora, D2, Mastodon, PixelFout, Audios, um, that is to say, um, platforms that we imagine had a different, at least that was the initial assumption, right? A completely different understanding of uh, copyright. And the third one was the specialized platforms that, of course, they were mainstream, they were commercial. And it's important to say, uh, by alternative here, we meant non-commercial platforms that had some form of distributed uh, infrastructure of governance. Uh, but they specialize is that they were very similar uh, to the mainstream ones, but they were catering to a particular public. So Twitch, um, the video game streaming platforms, Vimeo, the more artsy kind of uh, YouTube, fun fiction, Dribbble, and Pornhub, the very large pornographic uh, platform. Right. Uh, so the way we, uh, it, it was a really, um, I would say, challenging project in terms of how to do this. So in terms of policies, the biggest problem was just the sheer amount of documents, right? So we use it, um, uh, we, we look at, we collected our documents connected with those 15 platforms. So uh, we collected in, using Wayback Machine and the platform's own websites, over 600 uh, versions of those policies because we're not just interested in what's happening right now, as I said, but what, how the policies change over time. Um, so six, over 626 unique versions of those policies, but we ended up analyzing just half of that for uh, different reasons from discarding some data sets because they were too incomplete to also focusing on if there's like more than one version per year, we just focus on the first version that was in place by the end of the first semester and the version that was in place at the end of the last semester. And then we also focused because the amount of documents were so large that we decided to focus on six particular case studies um, as um, explained in, in, in this slide. And then on, regarding the automated system, we didn't take um, a longitudinal approach largely because we realized that, that this um, was not really particularly useful since uh, those, some of those systems were in place for not such a long time. And the one that was that we were interested in, which is content ID, we, there was a highly incomplete collection of documents. Then essentially we went into websites, but we also looked at pa patents applications. Um, and uh, in, in the case of this data analysis, we didn't do exactly this, uh, um, um, sort of uh, what we say a thematic analysis. We just did a systematic comparison. We just wanted to understand, as I said, how those systems work and how they differ between themselves. Uh, and yeah, we just look at one particular case study, which writes manager from Facebook. 
essentially because rights manager is a poorly studied so far system and we thought it was at the same time an incredibly important system uh yeah so now some um, of the findings right so yeah well, perhaps one basic thing is that what counts as a where is copyright in a different um uh policies uh it's very much everywhere so from uh the sort of a, a, if you think you're the intellectual property page on Facebook to how uh, YouTube regulate copyrights that they also have their own, um, uh, like standalone copyright website and here Instagram and uh, how uh, copyright is also embedded in the community guidelines. But so this is essentially an, uh, a summary of all the documents that we, that we collected. You can just see that so it's not only in terms of services, and perhaps this is the most important thing to, to, to understand from this table, is that there's also community guidelines, corporate policy, of course, but also very important help pages. Uh, and uh, Facebook, for instance, has a principle, because uh, of a Facebook principle as, they, as principles, as they call it. Then they also, some companies also have the terms of service of enforcement system themselves, so automated, um, copyright automated content moderation. Uh, the music guidelines, and then some alternative platforms who have white papers. So, so the I would say the uh, uh, landscape of uh, policies or uh, policy-like documents is just insane. It's just too large. Um, it's way more than uh, the very particular uh, and um, essentially sort of a contractual documents such as terms of services. One of the very interesting uh, findings of this research was how just if you just look at the numbers of documents and how they change it over time. You can just see something that uh, we're going to get back to in a minute, but how they, uh, some, especially uh, the mainstream platforms, they got like way more um, versions over time and uh, which um, is connected with the complexification um, of those, those uh, copyright content moderation rules, uh, which is one of the uh, conceptual findings of the project. Uh, so in terms of empirical findings, so um, what we realize is that if you just try to understand the different rules that really regulate copyright on those platforms, there are, you might say, of course, this is um, in qualitative analysis, but you might say that there are 94, and that's the number that we arrived at, copyright content moderation rules, if you count all those 15 platforms. We also realize that they, those rules, they can um, be uh, Defined in, in terms of normative types, just such as rights, obligations, principles, expectations, or procedures as well, and different subjects. So it's not only copyright. So copyright can be broken into different subjects. So infringement avoid, avoidance, which is a way of regulating uh, ex and ex ante the uh, behavior of the user, manual content removal, automated moderation, disputes, penalties, copyright exceptions, transparency, monetization. So again, it's a um, really uh, a fantastically uh, detailed approach to, to copyright that those um, platforms in different ways take. Uh, and then when you look at the case studies, which we simply don't have time to really explain here in detail, what we realize is that different platforms, they would have different normative periods. That's how we call it. So at different moments, different sets of rules would be in place. And it was really interesting to see how those sets of rules change it over time. So here's just two examples. So I would say two, um, extreme example. So Facebook was the most complex platform that we um, analyzed. So it has different, four different normative periods and have, it ha apparently has a very irregular dynamic, right? So it sort of, it, it comes and goes. So it begins with a bare bones and there was a, expanded a little bit in terms of a number of rules. And then it simplified a little bit. And there was a second expansion, um, including the uh, use of automated content moderation since 2016. Fan fiction, which is a way um, uh, older platform to some extent, uh, it was much more stable. So in the beginning, there was no rules at all. And that, of course, fan fiction was not the only platform that had no rules. And then when there, there were rules, they were essentially focusing on disputes. And then the, uh, there was a change in 20, uh, 2009, and then that, that was it. <laughs> it didn't really change anymore. Uh, all right, so now we were discussing the policies. Now we're going to the automated systems themselves. So as I said, uh, what we were trying to understand here is it just to explain those systems, which in itself was a um, uh, uh, considerably uh, challenging task, uh, because as we know, those systems are opaque. They're really hard to 
um, get the details of. And this is one of the findings actually of this research. Uh, so we were looking at uh, content ID from YouTube, rights manager from Facebook and Audible Magic. Audible Magic, for those of you who don't know, is a, is a company that provides services for different platforms. So we also found it interesting to look at Audible Magic precisely because it, its system can be embedded in different platforms, but it's uh, uh, interesting in its own terms. So then we, this in the next slide, essentially describe the different ways in which we can understand those um, copyright uh, automated content moderation systems, right? So on the one hand, you had uh, the application and content registration. I mean, here I'm just going to describe the very broad categories in which we can uh, differentiate those different systems. So how you apply uh, and get a, uh, the right to actually benefit from the system. So there's also, of course, the identification and matching of the content, uh, which we use to, uh, usually that's how we think of those systems. Um, then, of course, uh, not only what can what the system does with the content, so the automated actions and now whether uh, those uh, the contents can be monetized. And then there's all sorts of rules around you know, disputes and conflicts. And uh, we also realized that you can differentiate those different systems according to their different business model. Um, right, so you're arriving at the, the end of this uh, presentation. So again, we won't really have a lot of time to explain what those uh, things mean. But uh, if, if, you, if you especially look at, um, again, it's sort of longitudinal trajectory of um, uh, the way uh, copyright is regulated by different platforms, is that on the one, in, you know, on the one hand, you had what we, we describe as a sort of a process of complexification and opacification. So you have more policies, more rules, more normative types, uh, and of course, the arrival of automated copyright, uh, automated uh, copyright content moderations, only makes it more complex and it only makes it more opaque. Uh, I, it's important to say that op opacification is also connected with the fact that this, uh, those rules are everywhere, including uh, help pages. So it's pretty hard to see and to understand every little details of those um, of these regulation processes. And also, we we say there's a platformization and concentration. By that, we mean that. Over time, what we realize is that platforms, especially mainstream ones, they started essentially uh, taking hold or uh, becoming much more active and intervening much more in the process of regulating um, copyright, because that was something, that, especially in the beginning, was something that was essentially outsourced to users themselves. So they said they had to uh, regulate their own, the way they, they post it and um, how they, they uh, engage in disputes over copyright. But over time, this was that that became much a, sort of a business of platforms, which also entailed a sort of a concentration of powers on the hands of not only platforms but also large rights holder. So, uh, and one of the things that it, it's impossible, our research doesn't really tell us why things changed in the way it did, uh, especially every single change in policies or in the automated systems. But it, it seems clear to us that legislation is an absolutely important background. It's something that, of course, uh, uh, it's uh, the beginning, the, uh, the means and the end of those processes. But it, it was hard to see how specific forms of legislation changed um, those policies and automated systems. So it's not necessarily the most important cause of factor. Uh, there's a very interesting spin-off product, uh, which is the Platform Governance Archive. Uh, and I, um, I mean, I'm not going to describe it in detail, but I invite you to have a look at it, Google it. Um, if essentially it's a repository of all the data that we got or part of the data that we uh, collected for this project. And that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Joel. Um, all right, so there's already, there's already a question um, in the chat and I just want to remind the participants that we can kind of <clears throat> collect questions here for the for the Q&A afterwards. Before I hand over to Paloma, maybe already one, <clears throat> one question just back to, to Joao in terms of maybe just adding one thing. I mean, I think you've highlighted quite clearly that automated content moderation and especially also automated copyright content moderation is more than matching. I mean, apparently the public debate seems to focus a lot on that like what items are being matched? Is this overblocking or underblocking? Um, and how, how, how well do these systems perform in, in matching stuff? So there's a lot of focus on that. And I think you've made, made clear kind of that there are other parts of the process where um, 
where these systems make a difference. Um, maybe you can, because now the presentation was very kind of high level and you just kind of made this argument, maybe you can maybe just make one or two examples, but maybe one is enough to highlight one aspect of these other, I think other four or five um, stages that, that, you, that, that, that you mentioned, like before and after the matching process, where you would say, okay, there's also a normative decision that say that could be this way or that way. And that makes a difference in how these systems are being built. Yeah, no, you're totally right, Christian. Let me, maybe I should share my screen a little bit again, um, just so uh, folks can see what I'm talking about here. Um, so if you see, if you see this first um, part of the, of the um, uh, table that we created, trying to differentiate those three different uh, copyright content moderation systems, you see that the first category is application and content registration. So I think that was a very, um, yeah, to some extent surprising finding that we usually, most of the research, if not all of the research is heavily concerned with the algorithm itself. I mean, how the algorithm works or not one algorithm, but a set of different algorithms uh, that we also have a very few, like not a lot of insights into it. But uh, what we realized is that uh, perhaps the first you know, uh, bottleneck of, of the first um, sort, of a sort of a power inequality or a general inequality is that who gets to be part of, this, um, of those systems, who gets to be accepted uh, uh, and can have their, their content protected, right? So to consider for instance, uh, rights manager, um, so, in order for you to become a user of the system and has and, 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 and in order for you to have your contents protected, you have to one have a multiple pieces of original content. Uh, you have to have a non-private Facebook page and a user history, um, uh, it, they will consider your, your history of copyright violations. Of course, if you violated copyright, uh, it makes uh, much harder for you to uh, get your content protected by rights manager. Uh, and uh, like in the, in, the, in the case of content ID, it's a substantial body of original material and many previously submitted valid, valid takedown requests. So you can just see here that it's, there's a, a very clear bias towards large rights holder, holders, right? So if you don't have a lot of content or if, and if the, 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 or the platform decides that your content is not, you know, maybe, uh, uh, I know, profitable enough, that's one way of thinking. We don't really know because uh, it, why, why it's very clear that the platforms will make all sorts of uh, attempts to differentiate between those who have the right to have their contents protected and those who don't have. At the level that we were analyzing, which is the level of the public facing documents, it's also incredibly vague. <laughs> and of course, let's not uh, um, uh, be naive, this vagueness is uh, made on purpose, right? So it, it's vague because it gives them um, that sort of this very vague wording of the conditions of eligibility. It essentially gives um, platforms a lot of leeway and wiggle room um, um, in the moment that they have to decide who they're going to accept it or not. And we even did this sort of a um, mock application and was dismissed in a matter of hours, uh, which of course, it's a, a different question is whether they use automated uh, algorithms also to even analyze your application, which is something that we don't know, right? Uh, to, be, uh, to be clear, I mean, and honest, I think uh, Facebook also, uh, Facebook did answer some of our questions. We sent questions to Facebook and they were very kind in answering some of those questions, but it's still, even the answers to the questions, they were not enough to really understand how those systems work. And, and then of the day, what matters is what the users, the people who real, not the researchers like us, but people who are actually looking at those pages and trying to understand whether they can um, have the right to, to, to apply and, and get their contents protected. We will understand of those systems. And it's very clear that there's not a lot of information on that. Uh, so, th so that would be the first inequality, right? And uh, which I, it's very, in my view, clearly benefits large uh, copyright holders. Uh, here, then there is also, for instance, in terms of disputes, um, this is incredibly vague. And it's, uh, for instance, um, in the case of rights manager, if you, if, if when you, when you apply and you are rejected, as we did, or as we was, we were, it, it, it's very, it's very hard for you to understand how can you, why you were rejected. There's no clear explanation. 
And then if you try to um, uh, um, essentially uh, argue with Facebook and say, hey, but can I apply again? I mean, there's, uh, apparently there's no way of doing this. So yeah, I mean, I think that uh, perhaps the main takeaway here is that Thank you. it's not only the algorithm. <laughs> All right, thank you. Yeah, we will get back also to these questions of kind of kind of accountability and transparency with Joao Quintai's question in the chat. But now I would like to, um, yeah, invite Paloma to um, to intervene here. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, I haven't bring any presentation. I just wanted to create a dialogue with Joao, and thank you very much, Joao, for this presentation. There are a few things that are striking me straight away when I'm comparing my head with how hate speech content moderation works on the particular case of Facebook. So I can walk you through. So basically, um, we have to post any, any posts on the platform. Uh, Facebook uses content standards, but it also has the community standards, but also has the content standards. And how the content standards are um, uh, tools or how they are written down basically is the public policy team who every two weeks meet up and if there is any trigger event and based on data they feed those content standards and that's what is transposed or, tra or, or transferred into human moderation and automatic moderation because they both work um, hand with hand in fact human moderation is used to feed automatic moderation so what, what, what I was thinking, and, and Joe, maybe you can actually help me out here, is uh, you were, you were um, throwing the, the, it is a quite detailed approach to copyright. Um, that there is very little room for users to actually get back and, and put that content up. So the circulation of content is much more constrained than it would be for hate speech. And somehow, what we are suggesting is that majoritarian uh, authors have more chances of having the copyright uh, protected than minoritarian ones. Am I correct on those appreciations? Oh, that's true. That's essentially what we uh, one of the key findings of this project. Which, uh, of course, we are not the first ones to say those things. But I think it, it's fascinating when you look at the sort of quote unquote hard data, right? And uh, just what platforms are saying and the rules and especially regarding automated copyright content moderation is just incredibly biased towards uh, the big actors and the powerful individuals and companies. Mm -hmm. And and I was I was also thinking um, you were also putting into uh, so so many words you were saying that the legislation gets aside of what copyright content uh, is. Um, they apply their own understanding of copyright. Am I correct on that? So what we so the question of legislation perhaps is that if you take a very, um, I would say, leg, legal deterministic view of copyright, you would say that platforms are just you know, following the law, or they're just you know, um, applying the law and whichever law or copyright law there exists in a given territory or country. But that's simply not the case, right? So, and because if that was the case first, the, the, the way platforms articulate copyright content moderation would be very similar because the law is very similar to all those, that, all those platforms that we investigated. And um, as we realized it, as we found, it's actually, they differ quite a lot. And it, if you also see the trajectories of those differences, right? So how, the policies and the systems of um, copyright content moderation changed over time. There's no, I mean, of course, you might we do we did find we did find like this um, overarching tendencies, those overarching um, patterns of um, complexification and opacification on the one hand, and um, <laughs> I already forgot the second platformization and concentration, but. Uh, it's sort of a, if you say, but if, when you look at the platforms themselves um, as a sort of a standalone uh, organizations, it's really hard to find you know something that they're like like as if our platforms are going towards the same way. Uh, they don't appear to be right. So if if but of course that uh, it's only a surprise if you take a 
like really stark legal deterministic view of how platforms regulate copyright. And we know that they that has never been the case. Uh, um, nonetheless, it was really interesting to see that uh, you know the, the the laws are essentially the same because those all those all those platforms they operate essentially in the uh, uh, same territories or same countries, and but the way they they operationalized the law or the legislation was just very different. So if um, that's one way of understanding, another way is that it was hard for us, and again we we I don't think we have the the right data to explain why things changed in the way they did when you see the trajectories of those policies and systems. But it's clear that um, there's no moment that our, our platforms change in the same way, if that makes sense. So if there was like one big change in, in, in copyright law and copyright legislation regarding which, for, which country we are talking about, of course, uh, focus on the um, largest um, uh, players here. But uh, they, there, there's no such a thing. So perhaps this sort of erratic or uh, really uh, different and hard to understand trajectories of different platforms uh, is one evidence that uh, legislation uh, is not the causal factor of how exactly how those changes are, are happening, or at least it doesn't have a, a, a sort of a determining power. That's perhaps the best way of putting it. Because uh, of course they, they just regulate copyright because I, I believe mostly because there's law, right? So I'm not saying that law is not important. It's uh, perhaps the most important background. The question is, is whether the law determines every single thing that platforms um, do or did. And I don't think that's the case. So, so basically how automatic moderation and copyright works, the system is quite straightforward, but the content itself is more valid. So I did something to prepare for this conversation and I decided to look into the other side. I was uh, exploring on Reddit, people who were sharing hacks to avoid copyright. So, so um, I attended a couple of, of conversations with them and it was quite interesting because precisely what you were saying is um, some platforms actually uh, list up the, the, the content that they cannot reproduce or they cannot, that they are, it's gonna be detected and deleted. But the frequency of change is incredibly fast. So it depends of the companies and the company's law and the, and the records and the records decisions. I was looking into the musical industry. So the big conclusion among those who were discussing is that this is very unstable. Still, they are sharing hacks about how to avoid the copyright and how to avoid the algorithm in particular. So they were sharing tricks about splitting and how many seconds do you have to split even depending on the regional, the region where you were, uh, you you can split the videos in a particular way or another. I can't, I, I can't help thinking, I can't help comparing with hate speech. And I think that at some point there is something about the, let's call it with, with some distance, the spirit of the law that is still applies. Copyright is quite straightforward. It's uh, authorship that should not be reproduced if you are not the author. Therefore, it takes out. Now, what it calls my attention is that hate speech moderation is objectionable. Therefore, it means that the capacity that hate speech content has to be on the platform or the time span is longer than any uh, copyright piece of content, which says things about different systems they apply and how they construct their moderation systems as well, the rationale behind those different moderations to the extent that I'm tempted to say that we, if we talk about hate speech, we talk about automatic moderation, but if we talk about copyright, we talk about automatic detention. Being automatic detention in automatic moderation, only one bit, only one part of the entire process. Do I explain myself? No, I think so, yeah. I just, you're right. I think it may be that's, so the, I'm gonna say, I think the, the idea that copyright is straightforward, I'm not wholly sure about that. And I think, but the, the important part is that that's the, the approach that platforms take. Mm -hmm. So the platforms, so copyright is not 
straightforward at all. I mean, uh, that's why, I mean, there's so much um, discussion around copyright. What is, of course, uh, fair use and all the exceptions to copyright. Mm -hmm. The interesting part of um, how you, when you analyze those, both the automated and non-automated copyright uh, content moderation systems on platforms is that from the platform perspective, <laughs> they really simplified. It's really, um, uh, 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 perhaps, it, uh, it, but in, in that sense, I, I think it's, um, there's also a connection with hate speech, right? And how automated recognition of hate speech, uh, of course, they might try to make it different, but uh, it has to flatten context. It has to flatten um, um, sort of a, a, a cultural aspects if they are to, to, to moderate at scale. So there's always a flattening and there's always a, a process of simplification that at the end of the day, it's uh, essentially detrimental to freedom of, of expression. And um, that's of course the gamble and the, the uh, or at least that's how platforms portray the problem, right? So there's a gamble. You, we either moderate uh, content thinking of um, both copyright or hate speech or any other uh, rule that they are trying to enforce, or we don't. And if we moderate, there will be injustices. And yeah, we know there are injustices and what can we do? It's impossible to do this. Uh, and, uh, and you just have to accept the problem. So you just have to accept that this is impossibly complicated. And, uh, and it's as if this was the price of having uh, very large scale platforms and being able apparently to speak what you wish, which of course that's not necessarily the case. Okay, let me, let me perhaps rephrase that because uh, what I uh, meant is the copyright system, the dynamic that it establishes with a user is more top down. That's what I meant. So, so you do have, the possibility to prove that that copyright piece of content, that you do have the right to use that piece of content, therefore it can be on the platform and you have a few strikes in the case of YouTube. In the case of hate speech, you do have appealing systems, but which you debate is not the right of using any piece, but is the, if the piece of content that you are uh, posting or you are uh, uploading, if it is racist, of it is not. So the conversation is not as straightforward, for, according to social media rationale, as it is copyright. That's what I meant. So, so the process, so you have a, a, a automatic moderation on hate speech is only 25% of the entire process. It is what detects the content online, but then it goes into a system where you rather, the algorithm rather it uses visibility, but content stays online. The algorithm deletes visibility or it as it is. And if it is problematic, it goes into automatic, into human review, and they follow exactly the three seven steps. Reduce visibility, and then they send you to us, as a user, they send you a message. And the message said, are you, do you agree with the decision? And if you say no, the chances are that they are gonna be reviewed again. But on that time, the content is probably gonna be all right then on hold, or visible. So, so the interaction that occurs with the platform somehow reflects what the platforms think about hate speech, which is something that you can debate. Whereas copyright is cultural industry with rights, ensuring that they don't reproduce it um, and they don't get money from it. That's what I meant by straightforward. No, I think, yeah, that's I understood. Right. No, and I, and I think it's uh, it's totally right in the sense that um, that's how, so, um, and I think uh, what you just said make, makes it very clear, that's how platforms approach copyright, right? So it, it, it didn't have to be like this, but they decided to make it like this. Uh, I, I mean, I don't, I don't think that, it's, it's hard to make a uh, um, sort of a normative philosophical comparison between copyright and hate speech. I think they're very different things. But um, me, it's just, yeah, no, go ahead, Christian. I think I need to jump in here. Um, I hate to interrupt this conversation. I think this format works pretty well, but um, we need to um, move on in a way. And there's also some questions from the participants. So but already, thanks a lot, Paloma and Joao, for this uh, really fascinating conversation. And I think, I think particularly at the end also, there was a nice kind of um, <clears throat> Yeah, characterization of the differences and similarities of hate speech and copyright 
content moderation by, by Paloma and also reflected by Joao. But let me ask you some of the questions uh, from the chat. So, um, so we have five minutes left before we jump to the next panel. Um, so the first one is uh, just kind of a um, question to Joao. How did you choose the case studies? From uh, This is a question from Marcela Favar. Yeah, I mean, uh, Christian and I, we sat down home in the beginning of 2020 and we sort of realized that, that we wanted, first, of course, to be able to capture at the time uh, what we consider to be the most important social media platform. So YouTube, Facebook, um, Twitter, which is not the largest, but it's, uh, of course, incredibly influ influential, uh, Instagram. Uh, and also, uh, so maybe if we, let's say, if we were making a decision at Today, we would include most likely TikTok, but uh, TikTok at that moment wasn't that such a gigantic actor today to have over 1 billion um, users, of course. But, uh, and also we wanted to have at least one large platform that was European uh, and that, that's why we included SoundCloud, for instance. And then we, at the time, especially uh, like almost two years ago, what we had in mind is that there was this mainstream or sort of a corporate understanding of uh, copyright content moderation. And there was the alternative way of doing things. And we, we at the time, we had this idea that those alternative platforms would be really different. Uh, one of the conclusions that they are different, but not so radically different in terms of content. So that's why also we had this different alternative platforms. And then when we were choosing those platforms, uh, essentially, we're looking at um, sort of, a, you know, on the one hand, diversity, so different ways of approaching copyright. So we have, for instance, the DTube, which um, uses uh, blockchain to regulate content generally, and, on the, and something that's much more um, not low tech, but not as uh, uh, technologically complex, such as uh, 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 diaspora, for instance, which has been hailed as you know, an alternative to uh, large platforms. And lastly, we had this uh, sort of those um, uh, specialized platforms, which we just, again, uh, assume that they, they use some of the same technologies and the same logics of the mainstream platforms, but maybe perhaps that was our initial assumption, they could have a different approach to uh, copyrights because they were catering to specific publics. I mean, uh, it's always hard to explain exactly uh, how we, we choose uh, case studies and uh, uh, platforms in this case, but maybe that's one way of explaining. All right, and then there's also a question on the um, on changes in the policies and specifically, I think also one aspect that was interesting to us also, but maybe more also in the second phase of the project, but I will articulate the question nonetheless. It's from um, Yudim Bonu, um, and the question is, from the analysis of the data you collected on copyright moderation from major platforms, could you say that there are noticeable or major changes in their approach from the time Article 17 of the Copyright Directive was initially introduced, that is, or when Article 13 maybe already first appeared? No, we, if I, we couldn't um, point out, we couldn't sort of identify any particular change. But again, um, of course, it was just the sort of a European um, level decision on this, on this legislation. And now that the legislation is actually being implemented in different countries, maybe there has been differences. Because, you know, our data collection uh, span uh, or ended at the end of 2020. Uh, just because we needed to end at some point. So maybe that changes are happening right now and we don't know. So as Christian said, probably the second part of the project, we'll be able to look at it. All right. So thanks a lot again, um, Paloma and Joao for these, for these insights and the conversation. Um, yeah, and I think maybe also the last part and the last question was already a nice bridge to the second part, um, not only of the project, but also of the seminar. Because um, as... The project also the seminar here uh, kind of proceeds to the question of kind of the impact um, of these automated systems on culture and diversity and access to culture specifically. Um, because in the second part of the project, we will also look more broadly at, at these questions. So how does the world look like when these when these systems are taking more and more um, shape and are more and more um, deployed, and of course, with the view to to the implementation of the of uh, of the copyright directive in Europe, because it's interesting to see now that the project phase is nicely kind of fitting the implementation phase um, for the people that are following this. 
debate. Um, and so we might have answers to that question um, at the end of next year. And, but in order to learn a bit for, for that next phase, we also invited um, Ariadna and, and Julia in order to, uh, to share their insights, both from the policy process, but also from research um, on, on copyright, but also other areas of, um, of creative content on platforms. Um, and so, yeah, we're going to shift to the second uh, panel. The panel will be moderated by Joao, and then we will hear the inputs from Ariadna and Julia. So I guess I hand over shortly to Joao, and then yeah, we go on. So you All right. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Christian. Uh, yeah, I think it's. Um, I think my whole role here is essentially well presenting you again. So um, the second part of this uh, webinar, um, we are going to discuss the implications of automated content moderation for diversity and access, and uh, we're going to hear from Ariana Matamoros Fernandez. She is a uh, lecturer in digital media in, this, in the School of Communications at QUT and chief investigator at the Digital Media Research Center, GMRC, and associate investigator at the National ARC Center for Excellence for Automated, of Excellence for Automated Decision Making and Society. Uh, and uh, she will um, talk with Julia Reda, which um, Christian already um, presented her very much from GFF and Society for Civil Rights. Uh, I don't know, maybe Adia, um, do you want to begin? Do you have a, a slides? Oh. Not sure. Okay, um, so the floor is yours. Thank you. Yeah, so thanks everyone for attending this webinar. I don't have slides. Um, so I will talk a bit, drawing on my own research and the research that we do at QUT and talking a bit about my own experiences with automated content moderations. And my idea for this talk was to just outline a few challenges and then so that we can have a discussion. Um, so yeah, as a way of introduction a bit, yeah, I'm Ariadna, I'm a senior lecturer at the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane. As, as it is tradition in Australia, I like to start my talk by acknowledging the Turbal and the Yugara as the first nation owners of the lands from which I speak today and pay my respects to the elders, lords, customs and creation spirits. Um, so my field of expertise is not copyright, nor I'm a legal scholar, so I'm a media scholar that studies social media cultures and how platforms govern um, the harmful aspects of, of these cultures. And today, as I said, I like to talk about the challenges associated with moderating harmful content and behavior through automated tools and software, especially because automated content moderation of controversial content, including, for example, humorous expression that pushes the boundaries of acceptability, ends up silencing the voices of disadvantaged groups. And, and these questions are important to highlight when we talk about automated content moderation. And I know that in the title it says that I'll talk about hate speech, and I've done research about hate speech, but I would rather like to focus on the challenges associated with content and behavior that harms for several reasons. So first, because a lot of subtle and covered, covered forms of abuse online would not be considered hate speech, like, for instance, as I said, racist humorous expression or everyday sexism. And second, because users can harm in a way, in the way that they engage um, online without intending to do so, without being aware that they are harming. So they would not consider that they are engaging. And, and I would not consider this as hate speech as is defined in most of the platform policies. And so like my provocation or as a way to disguise is that I believe that a, a focus on harm as some of the latest legislation of e-safety bills is good because it, it pushes us to shift our attention to the impacts that certain content and behavior have on people, especially on historically marginalized individuals and groups. So the first yeah, idea slash provocation or known fact for most of you, if you're working around um, platform governance, is um, that I like to discuss um, is that content moderation on social media in general and automated content moderation in particular becomes an almost impossible task without paying attention to context, power, and history. 
And, and also, I'm not going to talk about language as a challenge, and, and it is, and we can leave this uh, for the Q&A because it's obvious that most of the platforms automated solutions um, perform much better in English than in other languages. So we can talk about this also during the Q&A. But to start with, it's important to note that the way platforms think about content um, and behavior that harms has a huge impact in how they approach automated content moderation. So platforms operate according to a logic that prioritizes overt hate speech and diminishes everyday normalized abusive behavior. Um, so a focus on incitement or a direct threat as necessary conditions for defining content and behavior as harmful has informed most hate speech legislation around the world and social media platforms policies too. And this emphasis on overt hate speech obviously informs the data that platforms collect and use to train the automated systems. So these systems are driven by these narrow conceptualizations of safety and harm. And as my colleague Rosalie Gillet at QUT has been saying for a long time, is that tech companies um, won't be able to build better automated tools until they really understand how their users experience harm and safety on their networks. So we need qualitative, qualitative research to really understand what is harmful behavior according to whom. And again, obviously, like understanding how people experience harm is much more contextually difficult than what a classifier can detect. And, and this highlights the limitations of automation to minimize content that harms on the platform. So for me, this is one of the challenges of automated content moderation. And, and again, as, as, as the research of Rosalie Gillett shows, is that when platforms focus too much on improving their automated tools as a way of moderating most of the controversial content, they lose sight of other things they could be doing to cultivate safer spaces for everyone. The second thing that I would like to like discuss with, with all of you is that content moderation would work better if platforms would pay attention to power and history. So starting for the platform policies, the platform um, policies on hate speech have tended to be designed on the basis of formal equality principles that we say, which means that platforms prohibit attacks on individuals or group based on identity factors such as race or sexuality. But these identity factors are treated as a singular and flat category. And this means that an attack on white people and for instance, straight people is treated in the same way as an attack on black people or people belonging to the LGBTIQ community. And um, there's another researcher at QT that has an excellent paper, Luisa Bartolo, on how substantive equality principles could offer a more valuable framework for working through the challenges of moderating harmful, harmful content and behavior. And she argues that a focus on substantive equality would require platforms to consider existing systemic inequality in their moderation processes which would help them distinguish between assaultive speech, as the critical race theories uh, um, um, conceptualize, and speech or conduct that constitutes dissent, so counter speech. So if we don't account for power, it's really difficult then when we have automated tools to really differentiate between power that like content that harms, maybe as opposed to content that can be offensive. And the last challenge that I like to discuss regarding automated content moderation is that platforms largely focus on individual pieces of content instead of zooming out <laughs> into broader context when evaluating when content, content and content harms, right? So um, I will like just for a while share my screen to make me my point here. <laughs> So I don't know if you can see my slide, humor and content moderation. Yeah. Okay, cool. Good. So let me minimize this so I can see. Yeah. 
So this example is an example of satire that punches up that Facebook did not understand as an example of how often platforms miss context. And also as an example of when we don't factor power, um, how it is a bit tricky to moderate content. And this, this slide shows an iconic Australian children entertainer, The Wiggles, that announced in August that they would be adding new members and characters to make the team more culturally and gender diverse. You know? And then this move was criticized by National Senator Matt Canaval, who complained that the Wiggles had become too woke. And in response, the, the satirical group wrote a headline that said that the show had introduced a new white wiggle to help Matt Canavan feel represented. Now, this joke is serving a socially corrective purpose by punching up. So the joke has a clear target that it's Matt Canavan that is in a dominant position of power. But Facebook was not happy with the hate symbol represented by the white giggle and took the post down as violating Facebook hate speech policies. So this could be do both because users flagged the post and moderators didn't understand this joke as satire or because Facebook's algorithms recognized the hate symbol and took down the post without understanding that this was, this was counter speech. So we can see the difficulty in automated systems drawing the line between what content is humorous and what content is educational, especially where pleasure and, and entertainment are part of, of this education. And, and, and most of the finds is not only about speech. So we like the work of Kath Albury and, and Zara Stardust also show that nudity classifiers, automated classifiers are particularly problematic, problematic in recognizing body parts, skin tones, and are often based on unrepresentative training data sets, the way that these classifiers are designed. So I think that as to wrap up this, like this intervention, and, and as I said at the beginning, activists have long denounced that automated approaches to hate speech, unfortunately, end up disproportionately taking down counter speech. And hence, this diminishes the opportunities that disadvantaged groups have to participate online. So when we approach um, the challenges of automated content moderation, I think that bringing into or discussing it again, like context power and history um, is quite important if we want to really improve these um, platforms as safe spaces for everyone. And that's it. Thank you, Ariadna. Uh, well, I have lots of questions, but of course, uh, let's wait until the, the end of the um, presentation by Julia. Julia Reda, are you there? Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ariadna, for the fascinating presentation. And uh, I think it raises uh, sort of from a systematic and academic point of view, a phenomenon that I've also uh, experienced quite frequently. Uh, including in the area of copyrighted content moderation, where we have this uh, phenomenon of copyright trolls. Um, and perhaps to give one uh, quite recent example, um, there is a uh, group uh, which calls itself Team Copyright, which has been um, sending falsified copyright notices on a systematic uh, manner to Twitter to try to take down um, the accounts of uh, K-pop fans, which were uh, expressing support for the LGBT community. And in this case, what they would do is they would take uh, pictures that um, the fans of the K-pop group had posted on their Twitter accounts, and they would then uh, copy those pictures, upload them to Twitter, uh, sorry, to Flickr, and then they would backdate them. So it would look like uh, the copy of the picture would be the original. And then they would send uh, takedown requests uh, and uh, to either get individual posts removed or eventually get the accounts blocked for repeated infringements. So I would say that uh, even copyright content moderation, which uh, is perhaps not the, the focus of uh, your research regarding harmful speech can also be weaponized in order to um, yeah, to, to silence particular marginalized groups. So I think this is very important research to, to um, highlight this. And what I would be interested in hearing a bit more about from you, Ariadna, is uh, on the one hand, whether you think 
it is possible to solve this problem through automated content moderation or whether at the end of the day, uh, a content moderation system that is um, conscious of power inequality would have to be run by humans and how this, well, what this would have to look like in order uh, to actually get satisfactory results. And I would also be interested in whether you've looked at the issue of shadow banning, because um, in the, for example, in the Facebook files, it was revealed that in the area of hate speech in particular, um, Facebook relies quite heavily on shadow banning. So rather than actually taking down the content, it would uh, simply make sure that content that was flagged by an automated system as potentially including hate speech would just not be shown to as many people. And um, I would find this quite challenging from the perspective of protecting counter speech, because of course, if uh, the counter speech is not being blocked, but simply shown to fewer people, it's very difficult for uh, the authors of the counter speech to even know about this, because uh, it could just be, well, if you, if you make a, a joke on social media and it doesn't get shared, um, it might just be that people did not like the joke or did not understand it or didn't find it funny. So it would be difficult, I think, to also positively enforce the right to freedom of expression of marginalized groups if shadow banning is used. So I'd be very interested uh, to hear your thoughts on those two points. Thanks, Julia. That was um, really useful and, and, and I really appreciate these two questions. Um, yeah, so the first one about the limitations of <laughs> automation. Um, yeah, I don't have a lot of hope. I understand that um, there's a role for automation, but the human in the loop has always to be like there because otherwise there are a lot of errors. I think that platforms are comfortable with the trade-offs of automation. So like taking down some counter speech, if people like complain, they will put this content up again and that's it. But if they take down most of what they consider hate speech, that it's a lot of counter speech, then they are safe in terms of um, countries um, putting pressure on them because of the legislation and stuff like this. So unfortunately, I think that it would be like for these big platforms like Facebook, really convincing them that taking down counter speech. I think that they are well aware of this problem, uh, but they are comfortable, as I said, with these trade-offs. Um, there's another thing I wanted to say about, ah, yeah, and then in any ways, I think that there's something to be improved in terms of the automated systems if we improve definitions. And I think that some platforms, Facebook has done a good job in a way of refining policies. As Paloma has said, they have the policy meetings. These meetings are like the minutes are like public for everyone. But in, in the case, for instance, of humor that I'm looking at, the definitions around humor and when humor crosses the line into harmful or just even acknowledging how humor can harm is not there. So if you don't acknowledge the problem, then it's really difficult that you will identify it through automation. And we saw this with hate speech before. It was really limited the way the, the, the way that platforms understood hate speech. It needed to be like super over than even like a, a like direct threat to violence for them to take it down. This has changed. Um, but I think that there's a definitional work on, on things in my case, like humor, but also like the research that I said by Rosie of really being more aware of how the users perceive harm, how the users consider these systems to be more safe. And, and with this knowledge, it's the same with automated in terms of um, automated tools that could be more aware of context. I think that technology is, is going through this. Obviously there will be errors, but there are more things that can be done. Um, about the shadow binding, I haven't done research myself, but I'm pretty aware of, of that this is happening and you're completely right because then you, because the platforms are not transparent, you have a lot of like community members that they, um, because there's no, no one knows what's going on there. This generates a lot of folk theories, especially if you go to TikTok or Instagram, there's plenty of 
self-appointed algorithm experts that they then you start like 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 I don't know hypothesizing that you've been shadow banned for this. So if platforms are going to implement new mechanisms and remedies beyond this binary of taking down or um, suppressing an account, then you have to be transparent first in how you are applying it instead of like being totally opaque. And second, I think that your comment opens again, like the discussion around how opaque these systems are for third party independent research. So more and more these platforms APIs are being like restrained for us to access and really understanding what's the impact of shadow banding, what's the impact of content moderation over time. And this is increasingly being very difficult to do. And so we will end up just relying on this report that platforms gives us that is just like numbers of hate speech takedown, but without really um, giving details um, for researchers and, and, and civil society organizations to make them accountable. So yeah, that's sorry, my long answer to your two questions. Uh, if I may, Christian, before we come for the questions uh, from the chat, I would just want to highlight that uh, in the council position on the Digital Services Act, which was adopted, I think, two weeks ago, uh, the council actually added uh, to the statement of reasons that platforms have to give when they block something, it now says that they also have to give a statement of reason for, to the user for any restrictions of the visibility of specific items of information, which I think is very interesting in this area. But I wonder if it works in a in a uh, algorithmic social media platform, because at the end of the day, a platform could easily say that they didn't restrict the visibility of content, they just basically improve the visibility of everything else. I mean, it's right. kind of relative, right? So I, I'm curious to see if this is going to work, but at least it seems that the council is thinking about this problem. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, I know those are very good um, and interesting points. Uh, I have just a very quick point to Ariadna. So I find it your point on um, no, that harm is not something that you can derive just looking at a piece of content as if the text was a sort of unmediated thing that it's harmful in itself. But I wonder how you can, again, the scalability and how to do that, um, this sort of a calculations and judgments at scale is always at the end of the day, what really matters when you think of like a, a very large platform. So how does approach that um, according to which we should understand harm as something that people feel and not something that's in, in, the, in the message can, can and whether, um, I think it's whether it can, if it can, how it can be made scalable, right? Hmm. How platforms there, could, could adopt it? How, uh, let's say Facebook wanted to do that, or you can think of other platforms, I don't know, TikTok or Twitter, how they would do this. Hmm. Well, I think that um, my point basically, well, there are different things. Um, first of all, I think that texts can be harmful by themselves. So I, I, I feel about content as a speech acts that can be harmful because um, if say that it's a joke, a racist joke that punches down on like racial communities, um, racialized communities, sorry, then there's a history of violence linked to this racial stereotype. This content per se for me, it's harmful because it's not um, assuring equal status to society um, to the targets of the joke, right? Um, what I'm saying is that um, sometimes by focusing on just individual pieces of content, we will we lose a bit like broader narratives that are going on. And, and first in terms of, of, of for instance, um, pervasive, abusive behavior, if you understand, say, in a race-based controversy that it's happening in public in Germany, if you understand the main narratives, then some pieces of content that might appear as borderline, you could consider them as part of this narrative that has cumulative effects to the victim that it's in this case could be a community, it could, it could be an individual, sorry, a group or an individual. It's difficult to like work um, to automate this, but there have been some experiments um, in terms of satire to analyze like um, pieces of content that are jokes on Facebook 
to kind of automate if you have a piece of content, then kind of zooming out and understanding where this piece of content was posted. Because if then if you go to the page level and you see that it's a public page of a, a well-known satirical like outlet or a, a well-known satirical um, um, author, then maybe you can balance or you can just help moderators or tools to understand what's going on. But obviously it's really challenging. Um, and also what you said about like feelings, when I say like really thinking about, or, or when we like ask the community how they experience harms, I'm always thinking about historically marginalized groups. So I'm thinking about and, and, and all this tradition of critical race theory, feminist um, theory, queer studies. So just really listening to those that are the target of hate speech and abuse to understand how they experience the hate on this platform. And as Julia was saying, it's really important that we know that trolls are weaponizing copyright policies for silencing. So if you know this tactic and then you hear from those that are being affected, then you can just think about measures. Um, but if we only get the legal tradition when harm was defined by 18th century dudes that con like conceptualize harm as just a threat or incitement to violence, then what we are quite limited on our approaches of what really harms online. Oh, yes, fantastic. Uh, so let me get to the chat here. So Daria Dargacheva um, made a question to Ariadna uh, on are there examples of better practices regarding moderation of hate speech, automatic or not, that do better than Facebook? So do you have any? Um, I know that uh, Julia already very was very kind here. She already pointed to an example. But if you have any other like good practice um, in mind, of automated Sorry, that, like other platforms that do better with their automated approaches to hate speech or yeah. are there any are there any examples of better practices regarding moderation of hate speech automatic or not that ah. do better than facebook <laughs> i don't, like the major platforms i don't think so um like the the <laughs> You have like research that is saying, let's talk, uh, let's think about alternative platforms because with the mainstream platforms, it's not about Facebook. It's just how these Silicon Valley um, um, companies operate and their conceptualizations around hate speech. So I don't think that one platform works better. Look at Twitch. They have a whole mess with the hate ra rates. Um, um, some people say, yeah, well, Reddit. You have like um, decentralized governance and then some moderators can like tweak the rules. But at the end of the day, this sometimes works in Reddit to build community and just have the subreddits with rules. But also you have toxic communities that the moderators just reinforce this, this um, toxic cultures without really intervening. Um, so, but yeah. Nate Matias, I think that he has done some research on like experiments on content moderation also through this kind of decentralized. Maybe um, this work could be interesting for the person that asked the question, but um, I don't think that there's a major platform that necessarily is doing better than Facebook, to be honest. But I would be very happy if like someone in the audience has an example that I'm missing that, yeah, my Paloma has um, her hand raised. Yeah, I, I also, Paloma and Julia, if you want to jump in and have ideas, please. So, so just to amplify, um, um, there, is, there is, I'm tracking down now this new platform. It doesn't want to have the success of Facebook. It just wants to make things different. And uh, this is when we come down to precisely principles. Um, major social media platforms are adopting these neutral viewpoint protection categories that avoid this reverse effect. That, um, it takes down content from those who are attacked and from those who attack, right? But um, so, so, so Facebook and all those platforms have this hated speech neutral definition. Now I'm tracking that, I'm tracking down now this, um, a small platform that John Terry, a footballer from the UK, 
has been um, building up with a tech company here based in Dublin. It's called, the tech company is called Marino and the platform is gonna be called the game of our lives. And basically what they have done is to put automatic moderation before communication. So what they do is to reduce the content and the visibility of content and the circulation of content. And they are feeding their automatic, they are feeding their algorithm based on a social justice approach to hate speech. So mm -hmm. instead of adopting this neutral viewpoint, we are taking into we are taking into consideration the targeted minorities mm -hmm. and the standing by minorities, people who has no representation or people who has no the same enjoyment to power or the history has accumulated over their bodies. So you can feed an algorithm based on these structural ideas of what discrimination means. So I think it's interesting, although we also might be start thinking on how this is gonna divide the social media landscape as well. So anyhow, um, I think I'm moving away from copyright, which I'm feeling guilty about. So thank you very much. What's what's the platform, Paloma, that you're yeah. saying that well, the, the platform is called the game of our lives, goal, G-O-L. Okay. There's a behind that. Just check it out, John Ferry. I have been okay. starting to explore them and and uh, and yeah, it would be interesting to actually uh, look at them more closely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I don't have much to add to that. I also don't know of a platform that does really well, um, but I I would say in terms of this, the commonality of those platforms that do better than others, I have to say, it seems like it's the ones that are based uh, not on the automated detection and removal of content, but rather the ones that focus on norms. So trying to create an environment where people don't post uh, this kind of abusive material in the first place. And I would say that this is also much more um, effective from the point of view of the affected persons, that it's not so much about having something abusive deleted, but creating a, a discussion environment where uh, certain norms are enforced. So I would say perhaps um, Wikipedia is, is a good example in some respects. Of course, there are also uh, problems with uh, silencing marginalized groups on Wikipedia, but I would say by comparison, uh, these sort of community-based moderation systems seem to fare better than the ones that are just focused on the automated detection and deletion of content. Well, those are very, very good points. Uh, thank you, Julia, Paloma. And Ariadna. So we are uh, moving um, towards the end of the panel. I would so um, I don't think we we'll be we have time to discuss both Christians and João's um, question. But uh, so I pose questions. Uh, Christian, do you want to 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 say it instead of me reading what you uh, wrote? <laughs> yeah, I was just wondering, kind of <clears throat> in light of what both Julia and Ariadna says, and in light of kind of the context specificity of of harms mainly, or of kind of content that is being deemed problematic, both in terms of copyright, but also all the other areas that we've heard about, like hate speech, uh, comedy, uh, but also kind of sexual um, content. Um, I was wondering if, if, if this is a kind of a general limit to this scaling narrative or scaling business of platforms. They, they seem to have worked so well for the big platforms. And that was kind of the success story of the Silicon Valley that platforms scale so well. And sometimes I wonder now if, if, if that pressure that's currently building up and regulatory solutions are being sought and partly also implemented, um, maybe, yeah, maybe that's the end of the scaling story. Because if you really take context into account, it just does not work. If I, if I hear you correctly, um, you cannot moderate hate speech um, on scale. You cannot moderate comedy on scale. And I'm wondering where that, where that takes us. And if you agree to that, to that point, or yeah. So that was my question to Ariadna and Julia. Yeah, I mean, I think there are things that are really difficult to scale, but there's room for improvement and also 
what I think that would not be accepted is that these this platforms keep growing without really making them accountable because it's a difficult task. So, and, and, and Julia has mentioned it's, it, they have a lot of power, right? They have a platform to maybe they can help change culture. Um, They've already in the US, they've already like say Facebook, like recently they added like harmful stereotypes, like blackface as something that it's not allowed. This is changing culture. And sometimes you see like YouTube um, banning misinformation that is allowed in mainstream media in Australia. So, I mean, th these are outliers of course, but they're like they have, like a huge, like their networks could be used for the social good. And I, and I know that it might seem naive and obviously like, again, I'm, I'm with you. There are things that are not scalable and we have to find different solutions, but there's a lot of room for improvement within these platforms that they could um, do to take into account um, context, to listen more to other perspectives on harm and yeah. Yeah, I think I, I broadly agree with that. I, I guess if you pose the question like that, um, is it possible to entirely eliminate hate speech on large platforms? And I would say, of course not. But if you then ask, therefore, we shouldn't have large platforms, I would also disagree with that because I feel there is always going to be a trade-off uh, with content moderation and there always has been, but that doesn't mean that we should give up on uh, all the, the uh, positive opportunities that large platforms also give in terms of uh, giving voice to different disenfranchised groups. Um, so I, I would say that um, perhaps to also weave in Joao's question a little bit that broadly speaking, the Digital Services Act, I think is going in the right direction of maintaining um, the limited liability system that we have, because I think that is necessary to uh, shield platforms from direct liability for third party actions, because otherwise they're always going to um, err on the side of over removal. And as we have seen, uh, any sort of automated systems of moderation are very likely to be weaponized against um, disenfranchised groups. But at the same time, of course, there, there are regulatory interventions that uh, we need to be doing in order to, to improve the overall situation. And I would say if, if the DSA is missing one thing, it's a little bit of a, a failure to focus on the business model. And because at the end of the day, um, the platforms are going to operate in a way that that benefits their revenue streams and their business models. And if those actually cause societal harms, I think we need to be more prescriptive when it comes to that, like, for example, to to uh, the business model based on targeting. Um, but generally speaking, I think the DSA is going in the right direction by not, you know, throwing out all of the principles that we have for content moderation, but improving transparency and accountability, especially for the very large platforms. All right, thank you. Um, and I guess with that, we are coming, coming to the end of this webinar already. Um, and I would like to thank um, all panelists again for their contributions and really engaging discussions. I really like the conversations between, between you. Um, so thanks a lot, um, Joao, Paloma, Julia, and Ariadna. Um, yeah, and I guess, and also thanks a lot to the participants uh, for their questions and their attention. I hope you um, enjoyed these 90 minutes as much, as much as we did. And I think it became clear that we're living in quite an interesting uh, times where we see kind of these recalibrations also happening um, between, between what, what we expect as a societies, between regulatory also kind of pressures and kind of um, trying to, to tame these big platforms and how they um, react to that. Um, so I think this is it's still kind of being shaped, this, this space, and particularly in Europe, I think it would be quite interesting to see what is both happening on the regulatory framework dimension, but also um, with regard to the platforms themselves, how do they react to both the implementation of the European Copyright Directive, but also to the newer acts that are being um, decided on these months and weeks. 
so um, it will be interesting to meet again in like one year or two years and see where, where we are then. Um, and I'm looking forward to, to do that at some point. So thanks again, everyone, and have a great day. You too. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you.